Welcome back to Financial Accounting. This is Consolidation Accounting Part 3. Now we're going to look at the effect of intercompany transactions on consolidation accounting. So let's come to the Open Tuition Guide. We're going to move down to one of the later examples. Looking at interentity transactions, let's look at example 6. This won't involve a complete consolidation, but it will show us how to deal with the first concept relating intercompany transactions, and then we'll look at a, a second concept to follow. What we see in example 6 is we're given detail on current assets. Now we know the receivables balances for each company, and we're also given detail on current liabilities. We know the payables balance for each company. So I'm going to go to my whiteboard and, and note these down in the same format as I've been using to consolidate my balance sheet. So let's go to uh, where we're creating our consolidated balance sheet and I've got P statement of financial position with a date and now what I normally start with is we've just been using general categories non-current assets, current assets current liabilities, maybe non-current liabilities. So what I want to do now is I want to use a particular account name, accounts receivable, and I'm going to do the same in my equity and liability section with accounts payable. The two amounts that I'm given for receivables are 50000 and 30000 So those will be amounts that I want to add together. And then for my payables 35,000 and 40,000 those are amounts I'll want to add together now before I finalize I want to see what my notes are regarding intercompany transactions because I want to eliminate any receivable to excuse me any receivable from the other party and payable to the other party so let's see what the details are. Reading in the description below the balances, included in P's receivables is $8,000 owing from S. S's payables include the $8,000 owing to P. So in the receivables number, there's an $8,000 intercompany amount. And in the payables number, naturally, there's an offsetting $8,000 intercompany account. We're putting the financial statements together as if this were one entity. It's not, but if it were one entity, there wouldn't be a receivable from the entity to the entity. So we need to remove both of these amounts. I'm going to subtract 8,000 from receivables. I'm going to subtract 8,000 from payables. Now, these aren't going to balance in the sense that assets equals equity plus liability because we don't have a complete set of financials. But you can see how these line items would fit into our full analysis and we would calculate a balance for accounts receivable as 50,000 plus 30,000 minus 8,000, $72,000. And for accounts payable, 35,000 plus 40,000 minus 8,000 will give us 75,000 minus 8,000 is $67,000. So in both assets and equities and liability, we're reducing both sides by $8,000 so the statement of financial position is still going to balance but we've removed the related party transaction we've eliminated this double counting so to speak now there's another related party transaction concept we want to understand how to account for in consolidation accounting and that is unrealized profit the concept of unrealized profit is when one of the parties sells an item to the other party could be parent to subsidiary sale or subsidiary to parent sale and the buying party the purchaser hasn't sold that item yet normally those sales occur at some kind of a markup so that the selling party is realizing a profit on the transaction but again we're accounting for both companies as if they were one entity and an entity doesn't sell items to itself and it certainly wouldn't be creating profit by selling an item to itself. So we need to eliminate any unrealized profit in the financial statements from these kinds of transactions. 
Let's go back to open tuition and look at the next example, example 7, to see how unrealized profit is accounted for. Now an important concept to understand in analyzing unrealized profit is that it's important to note the direction of the transaction. When the transaction is from the parent to the subsidiary, then the adjustment is going to the parent's financial statements. And one of the adjustments is going to be to retained earnings. When the transaction is from the subsidiary to the parent, then the adjustment is to the subsidiary financial statements. And again, one of the accounts will be retained earnings. The reason it's important to note the direction is because if we're making an adjustment to the parent retained earnings, then 100% of the effect will relate to the parent. If we're going to adjust the subsidiary retained earnings, then a portion of that adjustment is going to affect the parent, and a portion of that adjustment is going to affect the non-controlling interest. So let's see what's happening in our example here, example 7. The ownership is 75% to the parent and 25% therefore to the non-controlling interest. And again, we're not going to go through the complete consolidation. We're simply going to look at the adjustments to the financial statements relating to the unrealized profit between the entities. We're given our financials and then we see in the description during December 2010 S has sold goods to P for $6,000. S sells to P at cost plus 25 percent. Now let's think about what this means. This is going to have two possible effects on the financial statements. One is income statement only. And in a later lecture, we're going to look at the consolidated income statement, so that's not going to directly affect our calculations here. But as sort of an introduction, note that when we're selling from one entity to another, we don't want to record that. That's like selling to ourselves when we're consolidating our financials. So we need to back that out. So we would have some kind of adjustment for the sale of $6,000. Since we're only looking at the statement of financial position now, let's focus on the effect on the balance sheet of this transaction. The next line says, P had not sold any of these goods and all were therefore included in inventory. And then there's an item relating to the payables and receivables which we'll skip and focus on the effect on retained earnings. So let's do a calculation relating to the profit in this transaction of $6,000 a sale from the subsidiary to the parent. Let's go to the whiteboard for this. So our transaction is from the subsidiary to the parent. The sale price is $6,000. Now there's some profit in there. We know that because the description tells us that S sells to P at cost plus 25%. So the, what we want to do is we want to find out what is the cost so that we can then find out what is the profit. So the $6,000 equals cost times 1.25. Okay, that represents a 25% markup on cost. Sometimes the description is given as describing the profit as a percentage based on a margin calculation. If we were told that the profit is a 25% gross margin, then the profit would be 25% of the sales price of 6000 But this is a markup of 25%, which is relating to the cost. So in our formula to calculate the cost so we can then calculate the profit, we'll divide both sides by 1.25. And we calculate a cost of 4800 which gives us a profit. I'll move this to the right just a bit. And now if we subtract our sales price from our cost, we have profit of 1200 Now, once this inventory is sold by the parent, then the profit has flowed through the full entity and there is no more unrealized profit. But in this case the inventory sitting on the parent's balance sheet, sitting in the parent's warehouse or store hasn't been sold and so we shouldn't be recognizing this profit in the financial statements. 
Another point to note is often in the transaction descriptions you will read a transaction description such as this one and then a comment that 20% of the inventory has not been sold or 30% of the inventory has not been sold and then we only want to adjust the unrealized profit at that percentage. So if in this case 30% of this inventory was still in the warehouse then some of this profit has been realized we would multiply by 0.3 to calculate to a lower amount, a smaller amount that's unrealized, but in this case, none of the inventory has been sold. So to show the procedure of the calculation, I will multiply by 100%. Of course, that will give me the same value, 1,200. And what am I multiplying by? This is the amount unsold. So remember that component of the calculation. Then any percentage you're given unsold, you can plug that in and have an accurate calculation. Now what do we do with the 1,200? We're going to decrease retained earnings and decrease inventory. And we're going to do both of these for the selling entity. Now it's important again to note, in particular for the retained earnings component, it's important to note which entity we're adjusting for. So when I do my, let's look at the inventory calculation. I'll come over here to the right side of the screen. Let's calculate our inventory line item. I'll go back to my financial statements. I can see that I have inventory of 13000 for the parent and 7,000 for the subsidiary. And then before calculating my consolidated total, I want to look for any adjustments, and I know that I have one. So at the subsidiary level, I've just calculated 1,200. I'm going to subtract 1,200, and I will have a new inventory amount at the subsidiary level, which is going to be 5,800. And when I consolidate my inventory, 13,000 plus 5,800 will give me 18,800. Even if I hadn't calculated that reduction with the subsidiary, if I just subtracted from my subtotal of 13,000 plus 7,000, I'd still get the right number in inventory. But that will be different for retained earnings. So in calculating my retained earnings item, in calculating my retained earnings item, I'm going to prep my retained earnings line item. So for retained earnings, I'm going to I'm going to build that in in a moment. Let's do a retained earnings calculation. Let's do a retained earnings calculation and then see what we're going to plug in here for retained earnings. So in my retained earnings amount. Now, as I've mentioned, these calculations will become more and more advanced, more and more involved. So one thing we're going to do now is when we calculate retained earnings, I'm going to have a parent column, and I'm going to have a subsidiary column. And I'm going to do two separate calculations. So let's go to the parent first. We have parent retained earnings of $30,000. And for the subsidiary, we have current retained earnings of 15000 That's not all hours. We need to factor in any beginning retained earnings at the date of the transaction and back that out. So let's go up to our description. P acquired 75% of the share capital of S on its incorporation. When we see that statement, that means beginning retained earnings was zero. So the subsidiary retained earnings before adjustment is 15,000 minus zero and I want to show the minus zero even though it doesn't have a math effect so you remember you want to subtract the beginning balance now let's see if we have adjustments which we do we've just calculated the one thousand two hundred dollars as a required adjustment to decrease the subsidiary retained earnings so we're going to subtract 1,200 
And now the subsidiary retained earnings will be 15,000 minus 0 minus 1,200 is 13,800. Now what we need to do, we have our adjusted retained earnings for the subsidiary. Now we need to allocate this to non-controlling interest and to the parent shareholders. So at our respective percentages, the parent owns 75%. Let's go back and confirm that. Yeah, 75%. The non-controlling interest, which we're not calculating the full amount now, but I'll just note here you'll have 25% going to the non-controlling interest. So the amount for the parent is 13,800 times 75% is 10,350. And that is the amount that I will add with the parent retained earnings of 30,000. 10,350 will give me my consolidated balance sheet retained earnings of 40,000 $350. So that's what I'll show in my retained earnings line item on the consolidated balance sheet, $4,350. So our new concept, intercompany transactions, has resulted in adjustments in some cases to receivables and payables. When there's an intercompany receivable payable, we reduce both receivables and payables by that amount to remove the double counting. And when there are sale transactions from one entity to another and those items haven't finally been sold to a third party, there's some unrealized profit. Unrealized because it's been sold intercompany but not been sold outside of the company and so we need to reduce the inventory, in most cases it's inventory, and retained earnings for that transaction. Note in that case it's important to identify which entity is the selling entity. In this case it was a subsidiary. Sometimes it's the parent. You then adjust that entity's inventory and retained earnings and then complete your consolidation accounting. So what we have here, we don't have complete financial statements but the inventory line item is prepared now based on an adjusted subsidiary inventory balance amount the retained earnings calculation was based on an adjusted subsidiary retained earnings with 75 percent of the change in retained earnings going to the parent same procedure as we've seen simply requiring an adjustment to retained earnings before allocating retained earnings this is where we see the importance of identifying the selling party if we were to mistakenly allocate the 1,200 of retained earnings to the parent and reduce the parent retained earnings by 1,200 we would be decreasing the parent retained earnings too much and we wouldn't be decreasing the non-controlling interest accordingly so the right process is first identify the party who is the seller second calculate the unrealized profit and third adjust the financial statements of the selling party once you have the financial statements adjusted, you can complete your consolidation accounting. This concludes consolidation part two. Our next lecture regarding consolidation will be relating to the statement of profit and loss.